Thank you, worship team. You know, some of those songs kind of took me back to church camp. I really, I really like that. That's good. You know, I don't know if those are quite in 90s, maybe late 90s, early 2000s, but, but I've, I've thought that it'd be really cool to have like a, some kind of 90s worship jam session, just kind of get people together. And, and so, so yeah, Craig, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. You seem, you seem to be on board. Um, we got a good crowd this morning. I'm, uh, I really am glad to, to see you all here this morning and, and uh, uh, looking forward to jumping in here to Philippians chapter 2. We, we've moved on to chapter 2 now. And so, uh, so last week, or I guess two weeks ago, Darren uh, preached for me last week. By the way, uh, we had a great time in, in New Mexico seeing family. We were there for my grandmother's funeral, and uh, so we were, were glad to, to have that time. But two weeks ago, when I was in Philippians, uh, we saw at, at the end of chapter 1, uh, there's really this theme of, of unity uh, there in that last part of chapter 1. Uh, so, for example, we, we see that Paul, when he's um, seeking for them, he, he's, he's telling them to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And he goes on to explain this means standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side. So you see the unity there? One spirit, one mind, side by side. Well, as, as we move along into chapter 2, we see a huge lesson on the nature of Christian unity. And we see that, uh, that unity is it's much more than mere agreement, right? Much more than that, it's, it's uh, marked by an other's first mentality. That it's true Christian unity is marked by an other's first mentality. And it really is a radical thing. So I, I just mentioned I was at my grandmother's funeral this uh, past week, and, and I think that she is, is a really great example of this other's first mentality. There's no question, my, my grandma, she had the gift of hospitality, right? So she was one of those people where uh, her door was always open. She was always serving joyfully. She, she somehow managed to, to be... Uh, Martha and Mary at the same time. Remember just a few weeks ago, we were talking about that, that Martha-Mary dichotomy where, where Martha, she was always busy in the kitchen serving people, which, which that can be good. But, you know, Mary uh, was at the feet of Jesus, and so she was relational. Somehow my, my grandma, she, she managed to be both of those, it seemed. She, she really did have a servant's heart. She would put others first, but, but not just in her acts of service, but even in, her, in the way that she related to people. And, uh, you know, I, and so, of course, I, I experienced that firsthand, but uh, I've heard so many stories of, of this other's first mentality that, that she and my grandpa both had. Uh, you know, whenever my grandpa was a sheriff uh, back in the 60s, uh, they, would, uh, they would take in runaways. Like if a kid ran away and, and, and uh, he picked them up, they'd, they'd take them into their home and, and then send them on their way. And other, others who would get into trouble, uh, they would open up their home to them. And I'm sure that you can uh, think of people in your life, I'm sure there's many here uh, who, whose lives are really marked by this kind of other's first mentality. And so that really is a beautiful thing. And as, as beautiful as that is, as wonderful as it is, understand this passage that we look at here in Philippians chapter 2, it sets forth something even greater than that. And here's what I mean by that. We, we see, remember, Philippians is, is written not just to a bunch of individuals, but it's written to the church collectively. And so, well, if we just jump back to chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. Right, th this is to the Philippian church, this organized body of believers, right, with overseers and deacons. Uh, this, is, this is to the church. And so what I mean when I say that, that this is something even greater is that, you know, it's, it's one thing for, you know, this person here and this person there to, to be marked by this kind of other's first mentality. But what about when you have a body of believers, a local church that is, that is full of people that are marked by this kind of mentality? That's, that's an incredible thing. That's a powerful thing. And that's, and that's what Paul is, is saying that the Philippian church ought to be. And that's true of our church as well, isn't it? And so, um, this other's first mentality is, is not just about 
you or somebody else. It's not just about individuals, but it's, it's about a body of believers um, serving one another in that way. So with that said, let's, let's look at our passage this morning. We're going to be in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you would stand with me in honor of reading God's word, we'll begin in uh, Philippians 2, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Let's pray. God, I pray that as we take a closer look at these verses this morning, help us to see how radical this is, this others first mentality, and help us to see how that is inspired by the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that, um, that your spirit will work among us as we look to your word this morning, uh, that we will not only understand it, Lord, but that we will be changed by it. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in verse 1 of chapter 2, we see an appeal, right? Paul is making an appeal to the Philippian church. Now, it's hard to know exactly what Paul's tone is here, right? Uh, sometimes it'd be nice if we could hear him saying this out loud. It's hard to know exactly what his tone is. But, but it seems almost as if he's like begging the people here, right? Um, kind of like, I don't know, I imagine somebody who's like on their knees before somebody. They're saying, if there's even an ounce of compassion within you, please do such and such, right? Here's what he says. He says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, if you have any of this, then complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do you have any encouragement in Christ? Any comfort from love? Any participation in the Spirit? Any affection and sympathy? Right? Paul is making this appeal, and he says, if you have any of this, then complete my joy. And how does he say his joy is to be complete? Well, it, it comes once again to unity, right? So we saw at the end of chapter 1, uh, again, we see this uh, one spirit, one mind, side by side. What does it say in chapter 2, verse 2? Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And so that leads us to our first point. We have two points this morning. The first is, without unity, our joy is incomplete, Without unity, our joy is incomplete. Paul says, complete my joy. And of all the things that could complete Paul's joy, it's the unity of the church. Isn't that interesting, right? Uh, there could be so, so many different things that could complete Paul's joy. But he says, in order to complete my joy, this is what I want. I want you to have unity. I want you to be of the same mind, same love, full, of, in full accord and of one mind. And understand, this is not even a church that Paul's a part of, right? Uh, so, so, of course, Paul was invested into the Philippian church, but he's 4,600 miles away, and he may never see them again. And by the way, that's a lot further than I realized. I just, I just got on Google Maps and said, all right, how far is it from, uh, from Philippi to Rome? Because we know that he's in prison, and it's probably a Roman imprisonment. So I, I think you can be fairly confident in that. And so from Philippi to Rome, 4,600 miles, right? And he's there in prison. And yet, even so, what is going to complete Paul's joy is that they have this kind of unity, on one hand, that might seem crazy, but, but really, this should be the heart of any person uh, who's in leadership of a church. You know, just, just this past Thursday, just this week, I was talking on the phone with the associate pastor of the church that I came from in Missouri. 
and they're doing fine. Uh, but of course, there's, there's always threats uh, to unity uh, whenever church is going through time of transition, whenever they're seeking out a pastor. And so uh, I enjoy getting to talk with him and, and how I long for them to maintain unity during this time, even though I'm 450 miles away from them. And how I long for such unity in this church, right? And so, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. That's what Paul says, and I think that any Christian leader should, any church leader should, should say that. Now think about this. Um, if the unity of the Philippian church can complete Paul's joy from 4,600 miles away, how much more can it complete the joy of those who are a part of it? Right? So yes, the pastor, but also the parishioners, you, right? How much more can your joy be complete for there to be unity within your local church body? Right? And, and, and by the way, I think, I think when we're thinking of unity in the church, we, need to, we can think in terms of, of local church and universal church. So local church is you know, Emmanuel Baptist Church, First Baptist Church, or whatever, right? We are all local bodies that are organized, and, and, and so that's kind of where our, our sharper focus is. But then it extends beyond that. Of course, we have the universal church. But especially in the local church, like so the, the, the church in Philippi, the Philippian church this is a local church that Paul is, is appealing to. And again, if, if, if that can complete Paul's joy, how much can it complete their joy? How much can it complete our joy if we indeed are a part of that very church? So just let me ask you, first of all, do you have joy? Do you have joy? Now, maybe for some of you, the answer is no. If you're going to be honest, you say, no, I really don't have a lot of joy. Maybe you're going through a really tough time. Well, in that case, I would refer you to Paul because even though he's a prisoner in Rome, this letter is brimming with joy. We, we've pointed out that, that already just in this first chapter, we've seen it again and again, and we'll see it throughout uh, Philippians, this theme of joy. Even though Paul is a prisoner in Rome, he has such joy. Praise God that joy can be found in Christ. But, you know, one can experience great joy in Christ and yet still not experience it to its fullness. Hence, Paul says here, make my joy complete. So Paul had a lot of joy. He says, make my joy complete. I don't think it's a stretch to say that without unity, our joy is incomplete. Right? You know, God, God designed us not, not as little islands unto ourselves, right? where it's just me and Jesus. Of course, we all have a personal relationship with Jesus that's very, very important. But, but God's design is that we are the body of Christ, right? And so it's, it's almost like the concept of synergy, right? When, whenever we're together, our joy is so much more full. And so without Christian unity... Our joy is incomplete. And so if you want your joy to be complete, then pursue unity. And so again, that begins uh, with your local church body. It begins with worshiping together, just like we are this morning. Like as we sing together, um, have you thought about how it's kind of strange for us just to get together every week and sing? You know, not many organizations do that besides the church. But, but it's so very important, so very powerful. We come together and with one voice, we sing to our God. Not only to our God, but actually we are uh, admonishing and we're instructing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right? And so, so there's, there's a vertical thing where we're together singing with one voice to God, but we're even in a sense ministering to one another, singing and, and teaching and admonishing one another. Um, it's a beautiful thing, right? So as we, as we sing as we sit under the word together, just like you're doing right now, uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper, also called communion. It's called that for a reason, right? It brings us together. It shows, uh, you know, we are, we are one body partaking of one body, right? And so that's where it begins. Uh, you know, just uh, last week in our Wednesday Bible study, this book we're going through in the Lord's Prayer uh, quoted this passage from Hebrews, and I think this is a very relevant, important passage 
in these times. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Right? So, so unity begins by just uh, coming together and worshiping together. But, but that's where it begins. It's not where it ends, right? That, that's, just, that's just the start of it. Just, just like this is the start of our worship throughout the week, right? This uh, coming together for worship is just the start of the unity of the church. Of course, beyond that, we, we need to daily pursue in our attitudes and in our actions uh, toward one another uh, a unity, right? So, so we think about uh, our attitudes and our actions and how that may promote unity in the body. And again, we see in this passage that uh, it's, it's, a, it's much more than just agreeing on some stuff, right? Uh, there's, there's a radical picture of unity we see, and so that leads us to the next point, which is true Christian unity requires an others first mentality. And so we get into verses three and four here. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. You know, I served for uh, five years as an associate pastor in uh, southern Missouri before I was a uh, senior pastor in a different part of Missouri. And those, uh, uh, during that time uh, where I served as associate pastor, I, I'll, well, I'll always remember uh, the way that Joel, the, the pastor there, would uh, respond to people uh, who would, would murmur about music, right? And this is just one example of many. But uh, in, in that particular church, we had, we had moved to a blended service that had like both some traditional and contemporary elements of worship. And, uh, and people would come to him and they'd say, well, why can't we just sing the old hymns? I don't really care for any of this new stuff. Or others would come to him and say, why can't we just sing all new stuff? I don't really care for those older hymns. And uh, he would say to them, he'd say, well, whenever we sing something that you don't like, consider it an opportunity to love your neighbor as yourself. Because there are some people in this church who um, their hearts are really stirred by this music or that music. Consider an opportunity to love your neighbor as yourself. Notice in this passage, the word love appears two times. So first of all, the word others appears two times. Let me point that out first. So uh, do nothing from, sorry, uh, yeah, we'll look at verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or uh, conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So we see others, right? This is an others first mentality. But not only do we see others in this passage twice, but we see the word love in verses 1 and 2 twice. So let's back up to verses 1 and 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. You know, and, and of course, this goes hand in hand, doesn't it? Uh, love for neighbor and this other's first mentality. Right? We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. In fact, in this passage, it goes so far as to say that we should count others as more significant than ourselves. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? And so this, this love, again, focusing in on love in these first two verses, well, of course, this is to extend beyond the church body to all people. No doubt about that. But there is a special emphasis on the body throughout Scripture. You know, uh, maybe you've noticed in the New Testament the phrase one another comes up again and again and again. Uh, just one count that I saw said there are 59 one another's in the New Testament. right? And, and, this, and so th these are instructions of how as Christians in the church, we are to relate to one another. And of course, primary is love. We are to love one another. 
uh, one of these passages, one of these one another passages that comes to my mind is Romans 12, 10. It says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. Like, you almost get this comical picture in your mind of like, oh, no, you first. Oh, you first. You first. It, it, it'd almost be chaotic, but hey, that's, that's better than, oh, me first. Oh, me first. Oh, me first. And here's the thing. If, if we are all actually focused on the main thing together, right, the other things are just incidentals that we might give in to, to the other and say, you first, you first. Those are incidentals. But we're all together when it comes to what's central, when it comes to the gospel, How incredible it is to see brothers and sisters in Christ, instead of trying to get the upper hand and vying for their own preferences, they try to outdo one another in showing honor, right? It, it, says, it says in this passage, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, or some translations say rivalry or conceit, right? It's not about getting the upper hand, but it's outdoing one another and showing honor. It's in humility counting others as more significant than yourself. I've said this already in the short time that I've been here, and you'll hear me say it again, that one of the greatest problems a church can face is when its members take themselves too seriously and don't take the gospel seriously enough. We, we all have the tendency to take ourselves a little bit too seriously, right? Our, our own preferences, our own pride, uh, we, we, we bristle up against one another, um, and, and that's, that's, I think, the biggest problem that faces just about any church, is, is when, when people take themselves too seriously and not the gospel seriously enough. But man, when you flip-flop that, and, and, and people are really focused on the gospel, you know, again, the other things, they're just, they're just incidentals, right? Uh, it's, it's being united in the gospel. And uh, I think we even see this in this passage that it does begin with focusing on the gospel, and then from that flows an others first mentality. And so uh, remember last week, so, so last week, yes, we had the theme of unity, but of course last week there was also this theme of the gospel, right? Walking worthy of the gospel, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, um, Whenever, whenever we focus on the gospel, and instead of taking ourselves too seriously, and if we take the gospel seriously, then what's going to happen is, what's going to flow from that is this other's first mentality, where, hey, you know, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. In humility, I'm going to count others as more significant than myself. So let me read it again, uh, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And let me, I'm going to read a few more verses. I'm going to give you a taste of what's coming up next week. Um, and this, again, brings us back to the gospel. So we see at the end of chapter 1, it's about the gospel that flows into this other's first mentality. But then he jumps right back to the gospel he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. How's that for an example of, of, this, of this humility and this self-sacrifice? right? That's the mind that we are to have among ourselves. It really is incredible. As we come to a close, um, I want to focus in on this word humility in verse 3. In humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. One might tend to define humility as thinking less of yourself. And that often is needed, right? In this very passage, it says that we are to consider others as more significant than ourselves. So oftentimes, yeah, we need to think less of ourselves. We might have too high a view of ourselves. We might need to be knocked down a notch. 
So that's part of what it means to be humble. But that's not all there is to humility. In fact, I would argue that more than thinking less of yourself, that humility is thinking of yourself less. And that's not original to me. I don't remember where I got it from. But it's good, right? Let me say it again. Humility is not simply thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. Because here's the deal, like, uh, you know, when, when we think about pride, I'll just kind of, I'll, I'll chase a little rabbit here. Um, I think pride is at the root of just about every sin there is. I mean, you go back to the Garden of Eden, uh, they, they, had, they had pride in thinking that they knew what was best, right? God said, don't eat from the tree. They said, no, I know what's best. And, and, and every time we sin, we're saying, I know what's best. So that's a form of pride. Of course, we can think of pride and the way we typically think of it is like, oh, I'm better than you. And, and that's certainly a, a sin issue that we might have. But also, uh, pride can manifest itself in, in many other ways. Uh, pride can manifest itself in, in a self-consciousness of, of maybe thinking like, oh, I'm nothing. And, 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 and so it, it can be almost like a false humility in where we, uh, we maybe degrade ourselves. But still, the, the, the fact is we're thinking of ourselves way too much, right? Um, I think, I think we all um, would do well to examine ourselves to see how pride might manifest itself in our own lives because it can manifest itself in many, many different ways. And, uh, and we're reminded here of the importance of humility. Yes, in, uh, we need to consider others as more significant than ourselves. Uh, we may very well need to think less of ourselves, but often we just need to think of ourselves less. That's a reminder that I need. You know, as, as a pastor, I stand up in front of people, um, of course, Sunday mornings, but Bible studies, whatever. You know, sometimes I stutter and I stammer. I, I'll say stupid things, and I'll just, I'll just confess something to you. Um, I'll go home, and I'll beat myself up about it, all right? Now, on, on my best days, it's because maybe I'm concerned that the message didn't come through clearly enough. But far too often, it's just because I don't want to look foolish. You know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a weak, feeble person. I think about myself way too much. And I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm in good company or maybe I'm alone. I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, uh, the very first step to, well, just let me, let me back up. I, I want to show you this book here. It's a little book called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. Um, I've read through this book at least three times. It's a coffee-stained, little marked-up book. I, I, uh, I need to read it just about every year. I would encourage you to maybe get a copy of this. The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. Just the title alone, I think, is beautiful. Right? That there's, there's freedom in, in not, not thinking about yourself, not caring about yourself, not caring about what other people think. Um, but, uh, but that's something we've got to be intentional about. And, and the very first step to attaining this freedom is to recognize the pride within. Uh, we all have an ego. Uh, again, it might manifest itself in different ways. It might be, it might be thinking of yourself, uh, thinking too much of yourself. It might just be thinking of yourself too much. Uh, it, it might, uh, you know, well, you, you just examine yourself and you think about it. How, how, how does pride have a stronghold on you? And, and when you do that, well, that's, that's taking the first step to uh, the freedom of self-forgetfulness. Now, ultimately, the freedom of self-forgetfulness is found in the gospel. When, we, when we're able just to rejoice in the gospel and Jesus and say, man, I don't care about me. It's, it's all about Jesus. Oh, how, what, what freedom there is in that. When we do that as individuals, and man, then, then when a church does that together, man, I don't care about me. I care about Jesus. Um, man, that's, that's, that's an incredible thing. And so, um, it's, got, it's, got to, uh, it's got to ultimately come, though, from a focus on the gospel. Right? When we stop taking ourselves too seriously and we fix our eyes on Jesus, then we're transformed to truly love our neighbor as ourselves. Right? When we fix our eyes on Jesus, when we're transformed by 
Jesus. You know, after all these years, uh, maybe I noticed this before, but it just, this just stuck out to me the other day when I was looking at this. I saw the subtitle. Um, subtitle is The Path to True Christian Joy. I think that's really appropriate for this sermon this morning. Paul says, make my joy complete. So I'm 4,600 miles away, but that doesn't matter. Because it's not about me, it's about you. Right? That's, that's, that's Paul's attitude. That's his perspective. Right? You can make my joy complete, even though I'm 4,600 miles away, because it's not about me, it's about you. And implicit in that is that if you want to have that same joy, and by the way, that is his aim, right? He says it in chapter 1, verse 25, that his aim is for the joy of the Philippians, and by extension, us. If you want to have that same joy, you also put others first, namely your brothers and sisters in, in Philippi, your brothers and sisters at Emmanuel Baptist Church, right? Uh, that's, that's, that's what's implicit, right? When he says, make my joy complete. If you can make my joy complete from 4,600 miles away because my joy is completed by others, by focusing on others, well, that's how you can have your joy complete, by this others first mentality, by being unified in the gospel, by being unified in loving neighbor as self, by even counting your brother and sister as more significant than yourself. So uh, we're going to transition now into the Lord's Supper. So I want to invite our, our worship team uh, to come on up. And, uh, you know, when we take the Lord's Supper, of course, we're, we're celebrating this, uh, the humility and the sacrifice of Jesus. What an example that was for us uh, when Jesus came and died for our sins. But, of course, it's much more than an example, right? This is our redemption, right? This is how we are saved, Saved from ourselves, saved from our sin, by trusting in Jesus and what he's done for us, by, by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And so, the Lord's Supper is a very tangible reminder of that. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give some instructions in a second for, for coming forward and, uh, and, and taking the elements. And, and the, the worship team is going to be singing. I invite you to sing with them. Uh, if you'd like, uh, but this is, this is a time for you to examine your heart, right? It's always important before we take the Lord's Supper that we examine our hearts, that we make sure that we are in a state of repentance before the Lord, and that we really are reflecting on uh, what, what this is all about. And so I want to encourage you to do that, to examine your hearts uh, as, as you come forward. And, uh, and again, I'm going to give you some instructions here in a moment, but uh, I'll just say right now that, uh, of course, I want you to Grab hold of it, and, and you'll see that uh, we've got two cups stacked upon another. So on the bottom is, is the bread, and we have the juice on top. So take that back to your seat, but then we're going to take it together. And I think there's something significant about that. So why don't we go ahead and all stand. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and have the two middle sections just kind of trickle down 